So last week we began a study, a journey together, to better understand who Jesus is by the names and the titles that he's given in the Bible. As we looked into the title last week, The Word Became Flesh, we discovered five reasons why Jesus became a man. Do you remember what they are? So first of all, we discovered that Jesus, the Word became flesh, became a man so that we could see God, that we could see ourselves, and that we could see the person that God made us to be. We also learned that Jesus became flesh and blood to destroy death and dying through the power of his resurrection. And finally, we were reminded that Jesus became like us so that we would know that he understands everything that we've ever experienced or ever could experience. Today, we're going to look at another name that he's given. This is the name Lord Jesus Christ. The title is used almost 60 times in the New Testament, three times in the book of Acts, four by Peter himself, two by Jude, and James 49 times, and tons of times by the Apostle Paul. Let me show you a few of them. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, you caught that, right? What did that verse have to say? That's right. We can have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, more about that later. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 57 says this. When the perishable has become clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? And where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through, catch it, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you see it? God gives us victory over sin and death through, that's right, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, one more passage. This one was written by Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, who, if you recall, at one point in time, he thought Jesus was crazy and wanted to have him put away. But all that dramatically changed when he saw Jesus risen from the dead. Why? Because when you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, it literally changes everything. So here's what he wrote in Jude chapter 1, verse 20 to 21. Dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. So what brings us to eternal life? It's the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's what I want to do today. I want us to unpack each one of those three words. Lord, which speaks of his authority. Jesus, the name that speaks about his mission. And Christ, the title that speaks to the promise fulfilled. Are you ready? Okay, let's go. Lord, this is the title that speaks to his authority. Remember back to the first Christmas, the angel who appeared to the shepherds in the fields said to the shepherds, Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born. And he's been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Note, the angel did not say, a Lord, but the Lord. And Peter, on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, as he prepared to preach the gospel of Jesus' death and resurrection, said, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. The word translated Lord is, in Greek, kurios, and is a word that is used 600 times throughout the New Testament. It's not only used in reference of Jesus, but it's also used in other settings. It's all, but always talking about the one who has authority. Now back to the passage we looked at earlier in Philippians chapter 2. 
At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Look, I may have the privilege of being called your pastor here at the church, but make no mistake, Jesus is Lord. Mr. Ford may be the premier of our province, but Jesus is Lord. Mr. Trudeau may be prime minister and Mr. Trump may be president, but never forget this, Jesus is Lord. If you're looking for the one who's in charge, look no further than Jesus. So listen to Jesus' own words in Matthew chapter 28. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Yes, Jesus has all authority in your life, in my life, whether we acknowledge that authority or not, he has it. Do you see what that means? Let me try to explain it this way. You know the law and you're reading the signs. You know that the posted speed limit on Highway 404 is 100 kilometers an hour. You may think that because everybody else is going between 120 and 130, that it means that you can likely go a buck 25 and you're going to be okay but the second those lights come on and you hear the sirens blasting you become acutely aware of of this fact someone else is in charge and you do not have the right to do a buck 25 can it be any different with jesus in hebrews chapter 4 after talking about how god's word is alive and active the author says, nothing in all of creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one in whom we are accountable. Now, don't easily walk away from this teaching. Because so far, you've not been caught. We need to understand this truth. Jesus is Lord. He has all authority over every area of our life. Jesus has authority over our financial life, how we spend and how we save and how we give. He has authority over our relational life, how we treat other people by the words and our actions, what we do when we hurt someone. How will we use our tongue? Jesus has authority over our sexual life. Do we avoid even the hint of sexual immorality? Do we obey his word regarding his teaching about sex and marriage? He has authority over our work life. Do we do our job well? Are we an example of Jesus in the workplace? Or would everyone even have a clue whether we were followers of Jesus there? And Jesus has authority over our church life. So I have a question. How do you feel about Jesus being Lord over all areas of your life? He is Lord. He is the one who has authority. He is the one in whom we will give an account one day, whether or not we have obeyed. As we think about this today, perhaps Jesus may want to ask us the same question that he asked his disciples back in Luke. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Can you hear his question? Why do you continue to commit sexual sin? Or why do you continue to look at porn? Why do you call me Lord and still treat your parents with disrespect or berate your children because they don't behave the way you want them to? Why do you call me Lord when you use your tongue to tear people down rather than to build them up? When you hold anger and rage, malice, gossip, and slander? Why do you call me Lord and make no effort to make disciples? Why do you call me Lord and do not do what I say? As if that question of Jesus is not hard enough for us to swallow in Matthew, Jesus makes this one more uncomfortable statement for us. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. There have been times in my life, in fact, more times than I ever want to admit, when I was living on some kind of disobedience to Jesus, and every time I would begin to pray, dear Lord Jesus, 
I would almost hear him say, Lord, you're calling me Lord? Are you kidding? Are you even listening to yourself, Andrew? Why are you calling me Lord if you're not going to do what I say? Why do you call me that if you really don't mean it? Please listen to me. Jesus is either Lord of all or as the saying goes, he's not Lord at all. So it begs a question for you and me here in the areas of our lives that are not under his lordship. So listen to what the psalmist says in Psalm 139. He says, search me, God, know me, know my heart, test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The second name we're going to look at is Jesus. The name Jesus speaks to his mission. When the angel showed up to speak to Joseph about Mary's unexpected pregnancy, he said, she will give birth to a son and you are to give his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Why were Mary and Joseph to give him the name Jesus? Because he would save his people from their sins. The name Jesus is the Greek form of a Hebrew word, Joshua, which means Yahweh, or God, is salvation, and Yahweh saves. Now, it's true, Jesus was a very common name for Jewish boys at the time of Jesus' birth. That's likely because of its association with one of the great heroes of the Old Testament, Joshua. Joshua, the guy who finally led or saved God's people and brought them into the promised land, saving people from their sins was and is the mission of Jesus. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Jesus not only is salvation, he came to bring salvation. John 14, 6, Jesus even claimed that he is the only way to salvation, that no one could come to the Father without him. And listen, he's the only way, the only path to experience salvation. As Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are brought before the religious leaders in Jerusalem because they had the audacity to heal a crippled man in the temple. By what power, what name did you do this? Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, replied to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called into account today on an act of kindness that we have shown to this man who was lame and are asking us how he was healed, then you know this. You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom, we, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you today healed. Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved except for Jesus. So who needs this salvation that is only found in Jesus? We all do. For everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And because the wages of our sin is death. Okay, that's the bad news. But I have good news. Ephesians 2, 4 says this. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Jesus, even when we were dead in our transgressions and sins. It is by grace that we have been saved. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The title Lord speaks to his authority, but Jesus, the name Jesus speaks of his mission to come and save us. The title Christ then speaks to his fulfilled promise to us. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered him, you are the Christ 
the Son of the living God. The Greek word Christ literally means anointed one and was used uh, in the Greek Bible to translate the word Messiah. The Messiah in the Old Testament and the Christ in the New Testament refer to the same person. Now, in the Old Testament, Messiah was always used in the context of the messianic hope that was to be coming. When Messiah is used in the New Testament, the context is a completed work or a fulfilled promise. In the Old Testament, there were three groups of people that were anointed, uh, prophets, priests, and kings. And when a person was called by God to fulfill a mission or a ministry, they began their duties by being anointed. God would have one of his servants go to that chosen person and they would pour oil on top of their head and they would say, you have been called by God to fulfill a task or a ministry. And when the people saw this person being anointed with oil, they all knew that this person was chosen, ordained by God. They knew that they were to be respected because their anointing qualified them for their office. It's an interesting fact that as you study the Old Testament, you'll find that God never chose anyone to fulfill all three offices. No one was ever a prophet, priest, and king at the same time. There were a few priests who were also prophets, and there were some kings that were also prophets. You know, you can find that all of them were never found in one person. However, in Jesus, prophet, priest, and king are fulfilled. Did you catch that? There are prophecies in the Old Testament that spoke of a single person who would come and fulfill all three of those roles. Prophet, priest, king. That person would be called Messiah, the hope for the people. As God's ultimate prophet, Jesus was anointed to preach the gospel and bring his final word to mankind. Remember the story of when Jesus went to Nazareth, the town that he had been raised up in as a child? On the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue and it was his turn to read the scrolls. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom from the prisoners, for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the captives and the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We look at Hebrews 1 uh, verses 1 to 2 last week. Uh, let's look at these verses again. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets and at many times in various ways. But in these days, in the last days, he's spoken to us through his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. And through him also all things were made in the universe. And then again in Mark's gospel, God spoke from a cloud and he said these words, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. And God's ultimate priest, Jesus, was anointed to offer the perfect sacrifice for you and me. For Christ did not enter the holy place made by human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. And he did not enter into heaven to offer a sacrifice again and again, like the high priests here on earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of animals. If that had been necessary, Christ would have had to die again and again ever since the world began. But now, once for all, he has appeared to the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice for us. And God's ultimate king, Jesus, was anointed to establish the powerful and righteous kingdom that will never end. Luke 1 says this, He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High God. 
The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And quoting from Isaiah, the prophet says this, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the greatness of his government, the peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Yes, his name, Lord, he is the one who has authority. His name, Jesus, his mission is to seek and save the lost, and his name, Christ. He was the hoped-for Messiah, and completed, he fulfilled all of the promise. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus asked his disciples a powerful question. I think today, he's asking you and me the same question. How will you answer this? Who do you say that I am? <laughs> 